but good evening. Uh, thank you all for being here. This is a fantastic turnout. Um, I'm really pleased to see all these faces, a lot of familiar faces. Uh, my name is Shelley Moore, and I have been a project lead for the River District uh, group for about a year, a little over a year now. I worked with the Aquatic Center. And uh, this is really exciting time. Um, obviously, if you've been keeping track of the council's uh, record, you will know that uh, this week there was a first reading of appropriation for $18.2 million to begin the River District project. Uh, if you've been tracking the River District, you also know that over the course of the last uh, two years, this project has been at play. And there have been other public events where the vision plan, which actually took place, uh, essentially between 2016 and 17, got a little timeline here for you, uh, th that was the vision plan. And you had uh, JPR, uh, Ken Jones and his team that was leading that process with a couple other consultants. And then also uh, that led to meetings last year where we had uh, presented that to the public. And then the city said, hey, uh, we actually want to get this done. We don't want to be another plan that sits on the shelf. So that's when the River District Implementation Team was put into play last year, and we will talk more about that process and what that's looked like. Um, and then leading into after uh, April, so your final plan in view of this, which we're going to have to get a lot more chairs maybe for that, um, we're actually going to do the final presentation of the plan in April. Uh, so this is a preview to show you where we're at because we felt obligated due to the, the significant contribution the city is making to the infrastructure of this project that we should be doing this uh, now to, to share it with the public. So I am going to give you a rundown, maybe, of the agenda. So I'm first going to introduce the mayor and councilman uh, in, in terms of Brian Dickerson, in terms of them doing just an introduction of what this means to the city. Then Dave Weaver is going to give you an overview of the River District Implementation Team, what we've been up to, the process, and our vision. Then from there, we have three guests in town that have been integral to this process. Uh, David Dixon, who is with Stantec. They lead urban design and, and planning efforts. He's going to talk about our urban trends why this is important. Then Lori Volk, who has done a residential market study for Elkhart specifically, to give us an idea of what the potential is for housing. She's going to share those results. And then finally, our, our, I'm going to call him our featured speaker, uh, Mr. <laughs> Jeff Speck, uh, who is a renowned urban planner, and I'll do a formal introduction later, who will be talking about the plan and some of the details itself, so that we're going to spend a bit more time with that part of the uh, presentation. So without further ado, I am going to introduce at the same time actually Mayor Meese with a few words and Mr. Brian Dickerson who are going to share with you the impact they see in the future for the city on this project. Thank you very much. Good evening and thank you for being here. I appreciate it. It's been about one year since the Elkhart City Council unanimously passed a resolution approving and supporting the Elkhart District Revitalization Plan and implementation. Since then, a team of experts in planning and redevelopment have been working with the city staff and they have developed the master plan of the River District. This evening's event is intended to provide the public with the tangible elements of a larger plan that will be finalized during the spring. Public input has been and will continue to be a component of the efforts. This investment, investment is being immediate transformational changes to the heart of our city, but the true benefits will be felt into the future. As generations change, so do cities. The changes include on how we think, talk, and plan on behalf of economic development. The successful communities of the future will be successful because they created a destination place where people want to live. Trends show that millennials and seniors that are two very significant demographics prefer to live in urban, walkable communities. 
Millennials, in particular, are more likely to first identify where they want to live and then seek employment. Today in Elkhart County, approximately 27,000 people enter our city and county to work, but they reside elsewhere. We have a very unique opportunity to invent Elkhart, and we will benefit from this reorganization and reinvention for decades. The development is going to be a game changer, and with that, Elkhart will be in a league of its own. As residents of the city of Elkhart, this plan is about investing in all of you. I urge you to stay informed and stay engaged in this effort. I will now introduce Elkhart City Council President Brian Dickerson. Good evening, Mayor. Thank you for that introduction. And uh, thank you for all of you for being here tonight to join us. I grew up in the city of Elkhart. And through that time, I have witnessed my generation migrate away from our area uh, to cities that have different amenities and attractions. However, it is important to move beyond the obstacles of the past and embrace the opportunities to work with the mayor's office, other community leaders, and to move Elkhart forward to a better place. <coughs> what I believe our community has come to know is that by placing an importance of attracting young people to Elkhart, you will see additional industry that will follow that skilled workforce to a community that Elkhart's about to become. The plan that you're going to see tonight will create a walkable urban community, that which helps create the kind of place people want to live, work, and play for years to come. Our council believes in strong fiscal stewardship, which through the years of conservative spending have allowed for much of this investment and our public infrastructure that's about to be laid out tonight to take place. This council will be firmly committed throughout this plan to providing fiscal guidance and leadership wherever needed. Last year, the Common Council unanimously approved the River District Implementation Team, which you guys are going to be exposed to this evening, to lead this project alongside city staff. And as part of that, I know that our leadership, both in the Mayor's Office and the Common Council, is committed to seeing it through. This plan has included a market analysis, a master plan for the district, a development book, and let's also not forget that this RDIT group is working with developers and investors to be sure that this happens. This unique opportunity that we have has created an environment for our community members, business leaders, Mayor's office and council to work together in a way that this city has not yet been privileged to see. As a council and individually, we are optimistic about the RDIT's progress and look forward to today's presentation, as well as the final plan that will be unveiled this spring. I believe that by placing much of this work in the hands of Dave Weaver, who you guys are likely going to hear from this evening, and the RDIT team has led to the success we've seen thus far, and I also believe that that's going to lead to the success that we have in the future. As president of the council, I want to say a special thank you to David Hinkey, who I appointed to the RDIT team to serve as the council liaison, and his service should not go unnoticed. And I also want to say a, a, a special thank you um, to David and the RDIT team for, without their leadership, vision, and dedication, this would not have been possible. Thank you. Shelly, I like to walk when I talk, so I'm not sure how this is going to work, but we're going to make it work here. Welcome this evening. I really appreciate everyone coming out, being here, to learn more about the River District. This has been quite a time coming, and, and here we are to talk more about what's been going on. Why? Why are we here? Why are you in this room? Why the River District, and why now? Many of the folks in the room are in the room because you have some type of connection to Elkhart some type of passion for downtown. 
be it the Redevelopment Commission, be it the Learner Theater, IUSB, Wellfield Botanical Gardens, whatever it is, you're here for a reason, you're passionate about this community. Why the River District? We had a unique opportunity uh, a couple years ago. I sat on the board for the YMCA. And it became apparent that we were going to be able to do something very unique through collaboration and create what is now the Aquatic Center and Community Center that we also uh, all see going up on Jackson Boulevard. But for that collaboration between the school system and the, the, the city of Elkhart and the Community Foundation and Beacon, uh, that facility would have never taken place. Uh, on the heels of that actually taking place, it was apparent to us that we, had, again, had a unique opportunity to continue that collaboration and to do something even more impressive for Elkhart. At that time, we had, as, as mentioned, the community center was, uh, was taking hold. Flaherty and Collins, independent of the com community center, had um, made it public of their investment in Elkhart. And, and GLC had committed to a redevelopment with Martins and a new residential on the east side of Jackson as well. Regional cities really kicked off an amazing process that allowed us to think differently about what could be. Instead of thinking about why, why things can't happen, it became a conversation about what can be. And with these three cornerstone projects, we said, you know what, we need a plan for the River District. There has to be a plan. There's $100 million being invested in a small stretch of a small road in Elkhart, Indiana. And we better make sure we have a plan. We've got one shot to do this right, and that one shot is the River District. The Community Foundation, the city of Elkhart came together, and a year and a half ago kicked off a process, a visioning process that at that time was called the Market District. As we went through the process, it became a, a, a very apparent to us that the Market District wasn't about, or the district wasn't about retail. It needed to be about residential. We needed to get people living downtown. Three exciting projects during a strong, thriving economy. The EDC states that we have 9,000 available jobs today in the city of Elkhart that are unfilled. The recent, most recent unemployment data shows that uh, Elkhart is a 2.5% unemployment, and we have a lack of housing starts. 2016, there were 17 housing starts in the city of Elkhart. 10 were in Timberstone, which was just annexed in to the city at that time. Three were for Habitat for Humanity, and there were three net housing starts in the city of Elkhart. That's 2.5% unemployment. If we're not going to invest in ourselves, who is? So where will we live? Um, there are 28,000 commuters that work in the city of Elkhart every day, but don't live here. So with all of this being said, we kicked off the, the, the River District project. Our mission is to define the development plan and process for holding constituents accountable for creating a master design, a development book and assembling properties and developers to create what is the River District. Our objectives, a walkable urban community, a thousand housing units, uh, and to end, a supermarket with mixed use solution, uh, solutions, parks, river walk, and recreational amenities along with adequate parking. The River District was originally defined as uh, Goshen Avenue to Main River to River. As you can see here, what we're depicting is Johnson to Main River to River. This is the RDIT team. Um, for those of you that know me, I do not like to be up here. This is not my favorite place. And, and the team that is around me, uh, the benefit when a project is successful like this is you get all the credit. But the reality is uh, this team has done an amazing job. And, and the collaboration between the city and the rest of the constituents have been just unbelievable. Bob Deputy Pete McCown, Brian Smith on the private side, the public sector, uh, I'm not sure I would have received myself as well as the public sector has received the RDIT team. We are certainly weekend warriors and, and came to the game pretty late, but they have accepted us and have worked and done amazing things 
uh, in a very short period of time, Crystal, Jamie, David, Hankey, Tori, Mike, and Jeff. On the professional services side, uh, Shelly has kept us all sane and on, on the right track. Uh, Scott Ford has been brilliant and a, a real pleasure to work with Ken Jones, Chris Shockley at JPR. Jeff Speck, David Dixon, and Lori Folk. We knew that when we got into this process, we needed to have the best of the best. We needed to produce the best possible product for Elkhart. We needed someone, a group of people, that would push us again to what could be possible versus the status quo. And this team has done that. They have pushed us to create the best possible product for Elkhart. What's the timeline? So we were commissioned in April of 2017. That's when RDIT specifically started. Prior to that, it was the market district visioning process. City Council and the mayor commissioned us to develop and execute the River District Implementation Plan, which includes $30 million of in public infrastructure, and we estimate about $200 million of private redevelopment. Land acquisition is complete as well. We've acquired around $5 million on Jackson Boulevard. We're in the project design phase that will go through April, where we'll have a final release of the plan. Uh, we're in the midst of a project pro forma, both for the public side, what's the return, what can we expect to see out of this project, as well as on the private side. And then ultimately del delivering a development strategy for it. These are the various development zones around the River District. Zone 1 is going to be our first priority, um, and we will see something happen there in the, the coming months. But we've, we've got this prioritized by zone, 1 through 9. 1 being, uh, again, adjacent to the Aquatic Center, 2 being the Flaherty and Collins Project, which is underway, and 3 being the GLC uh, Project. Here's the phasing. Phase one through three in orange, as you can see, we anticipate, while this was a 20-year vision, in the next three years, almost 50% of the River District, which is a 105-acre parcel in downtown Elkhart, will be redeveloped, or in the process of redeveloping. Phase two, two to three to five years, and phase three, five plus years. Um, this is happening. We are sending out bids for the streetscape, in two weeks, we are breaking ground in April. We will have Jackson Streetscape completed this year. Uh, this is happening and it's happening now. Here are some of the connected areas in the River District, Jackson, Elkhart Avenue, and um, Junior Achievement Drive will all receive streetscapes. Uh, wide sidewalks, parallel parking, uh, center medians, potentially bike lanes, potentially depending on where you're at in the district. We'll see a river walk extension, that green area uh, circling the river district represents a river walk extension, a one and a half mile path around the, the river district. What an amenity, amenity for residents in the district as well as residents of Elkhart. Along with that, we have two rivers in the city of Elkhart downtown and we have zero access. We have not a single access to the waterways. So what we're working on is actually taking out the low flow dam there by Nova. Uh, that's a safety concern as deferred maintenance. The Army Corps of Engineers has wanted to take those out of communities for a long time. So we're going to partner with the Army Corps, get the uh, low flow dam out of there, and uh, put in a recreational waterway. This is not a high rapid, white rapid type environment, but someone can put a paddle board in, a kayak, and enjoy the amenity. We're also potentially looking at a secondary location at American Park. Along with uh, some improvements to the parks, Longquist Park and a new town green next to the proposed Martin site. These will be public amenities. The budget, $30 million public infrastructure budget, the first uh, allocation uh, this week, proposed allocation, $18.2 million. Supports property acquisitions, Jackson streetscape utilities, and the dam removal. Uh, we are planning on taking utilities from Main to Elkhart Avenue underground. So today, if you try to walk down Jackson Boulevard on the sidewalk and you're texting, you'll most likely walk into a utility pole. 
We have utility poles in the middle of the sidewalk today. We will be creating 10 foot wide sidewalks, parallel parking, uh, creating a nice buffer and very safe buffer for pedestrians walking down Jackson. In the spring, we'll look for an additional allocation of $12 million to improve Elkhart Avenue Junior Achievement Drive, create the town square, park enhancements, the Riverwalk extension, parking and incentives. Folks that want to stay in the River District, we want you to stay. We also want to incentivize people coming in. And those that want to stay, we want to incentivize to meet the standards of the River District. This is a community asset. This district is going to be amazing for everybody, and we want to make sure that we can support everybody, even if they want to continue to do business in the River District, by all means. If you have any questions, you want to see some of this material, please go to ElkhartRiverDistrict.com. The site is live as of this week. You can get some of the maps we just went through. Any updates on the progress of the River District, we'll get into routing maps as streets go under construction. There will be updates to the routing uh, maps and, and traffic diagrams. Uh, any update will be placed on this website. That's it for me. Thank you so much again. Okay, so now I have the pleasure to introduce the best of the best, as Dave says. Uh, so our first speaker this evening, and as we're going through this process, you should have on your table some comment cards and post-it notes. I just want to point out as you're going through and you're listening to the plan and the elements of the plan, uh, we really want comments and feedback, so please use those to uh, make notes. The post-it notes are really intended, and we're going to set up an extra set of the boards that you see over here. So the boards that are on this side, as well as the boards that will be on this side, are, are the same four boards that are many of the maps and the plans that you have just seen. And so if you have particular notes regarding the maps, feel free to just stick them up there um, related to what you're talking about, and we will collect those comments as well um, as we uh, collect all the, the feedback from tonight. So our first speaker, David Dixon. He is a Stantex Urban Places Planning and Urban Design Leader. He has led significant initiatives across North America to help cities and suburbs alike create a new generation of walkable urban places that help these communities adapt to accelerating pace of demographic and the social and economic change that's going on. David has been honored for his post-Katrina master plan for New Orleans and many other projects by the American Planning Association, the American Institute of Architects, and the Congress for New Urbanism and other national organizations. He received the AIA's highest honor for achievement in the public sphere, the Thomas Jefferson Award, and Residential Architecture named David as the recipient of its 2012 Hall of Fame Award as the person we call about cities. Uh, David has also co-authored Urban Design for an Urban Century, Shaping More Livable, Equitable, and Resilient Cities, and he is the co-editor and one of the authors for Suburban Remix the next generation of urban places, which will be published January of 2018. So without further ado, Mr. Dixon. that 
Uh, you've heard David and Shelby and the mayor and the president of the city council talk about it. that is much less typical than you might think. Uh, and also, I also mean the leadership that all of you represent. This is a place that clearly has its benefits from a community that's committed to its future and willing to come to meetings like this, invest in that future, act on that future. Uh, it is something we've been telling other folks about. You're, you're a great model. So with that, I'm going to jump into my more literal, my specific content here, my, my mission, uh, which is to talk about what a great time you picked to do a project like this. Uh, because right now, uh, we live at a point where there's sort of a perfect storm of opportunity that stems from changing, rapidly changing demographics, but also imperative that change that stems from our rapidly changing economy to do the kinds of things that David was talking about. And I'll jump into this more specifically. So, well, all of us were busy doing our jobs and raising our kids and doing all the things that kept us busy all, all day. Uh, our society was changing dramatically, so either out from under us or around us, depending on how you want to look at it. Uh, so that for most of the decades, until uh, probably about 2000 from after World War II, most of the, the, the bulk of the growth in the U.S., and you can see this in this, looking back at me, this first circle here, first chart here, first pie chart, most of our growth was folks 35 to 65. So if we added 10 million folks in a decade, seven or eight million of them might have been 35 to 65. Starting in 2010, the way we grow literally turned on its head, completely reversed. So that now, and for the next uh, two or four decades, most of our growth is folks over 65 and under 35. And there are some real implications of this. Uh, if we look at Indiana, I could have looked just at Elkhart or Elkhart County, but I think Indiana is sort of a more appropriate indication. Your growth is even more skewed, frankly, toward the older end of the, the spectrum, like me. Uh, so that 78% of your growth going forward for the next 20 years is probably going to be folks over, over 65, uh, and most of the rest under 35. So the implications for this are profound in terms of the kinds of communities we need to build and the ways in which we need to change our communities, but maybe I should more stress the opportunity we have to change our communities. So between 1970 and 2030, this country will have added 170 million people. Our population will have roughly doubled. <clears throat> of those 170 million, all of 2 million will have been school-aged kids. So in 2030, we'll have 2 million more school-aged kids than we had with half the population we had in 1970, uh, which means that most of our growth is households without kids, uh, particularly households with two adults in them and kids. So what this means is that right now we live in a country because of who we used to be, that whose housing stock is primarily single family houses in the suburbs at 62% of our housing stock, and we'll continue to have demand for that. The, the natural market in the United States for decades, and this, is, this hasn't changed, it's as true today as it was in 19, uh, 62, it's just that we're different now. The natural market for single family houses in the suburbs, the folks who are most likely to buy those houses are, are families where there are two adults and kids. Right now, instead of maybe being half of our society, half of our half of, 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 of us as Americans, that's about 22% of us, and that number is headed down. By 2030, the number of households with two adults and kids in them may be somewhere between 10 and 15 percent of all households. Um, there are lots of other issues buried in that. There are a lot more households with one adult and kids, but even households with one adult and kids by 2030 might be a quarter of us, meaning that the large majority of us will live in households that are singles and couples. And we are naturally, those of us living that way, much more interested in living in walkable, mixed-use uh, neighborhoods, much less interested in a big house than we are, and places to get together and, and meet and enjoy friends, uh, and begin immediately to think about places like the River District. But not only do more of us want to live that way going forward, uh, but frankly, the more affluent we are, the more we want to live in urban cores, in walkable places, in places that, that give us experientially much richer lives. Uh, so that you literally can trace 
the higher, oops, the higher your household income, the more likely you are to be moving into an urban core. The bottom 60% are moving out, the top 40% are moving in. That's actually because, well, I'll talk a little more about this later, urban housing is becoming a lot more expensive. It's not, not a choice. So all this goes to say, this is a magnificent point in time uh, in terms of market to create the kind of district that Dave was talking about. It's a very real opportunity. It's an opportunity that Elkhart and most other communities have not had for decades, uh, but you have now. Uh, it's an opportunity that communities that come together with the kind of leadership that you have are seizing, and other communities aren't, to be frank. So kudos to you. But now let me talk about the imperative side. So um, as everybody in this room well knows, uh, you are a world leader in a particular industry, recreational vehicles. That is exciting and wonderful, and, and we've really been impressed to realize how much you hold on to that industry. But everybody needs a more diverse economy going forward. And even and every industry, no matter what it is, is increasingly relying on educated and skilled workforces. We uh, are increasingly automated. So as people like me have decided to grow older, uh, <coughs> More of us are, I'm not about to do this, but more of us are leaving the workforce than joining the workforce. So the growth of the US workforce took a precipitous drop after 2010 from maybe a million and a half workers a year to about five or 600,000. By 2040, we still will have fewer people entering our workforce than we had in 2010. Now, what does that matter? Well, a two and a half percent in unemployment rate is great but it also represents some challenges because in as we go forward, oh, let me just, um, and as an example, just to kind of bring this home, if you look at Indiana, your, your workforce has continued to, it, it's, its growth is dropping, but by 2020, it's going to really drop. And by 2040, 2030, 2040, you'll be adding many fewer workers. So, what, is the, what are the implications of this? Well, <clears throat> what is happening in particular is that we are developing, as, as, our, as, as our workforce growth is shrinking, our demand for skilled and educated workers is expanding. Automation is actually increasing demand at one end of the, of the, of the spectrum. Uh, and today, uh, and instead of people following jobs, it's like, as you know, jobs, particularly I mean, if, they're, if, they, if they're looking for skilled and educated workers, follow workers and where do they want to live? Well, it turns out, and I should say, right now we have a 10% shortage in this country of this workforce. By 2030, it's probably going to be about a 30% shortage. I would say uh, my, I, my colleagues and I and, and Jeff are working in lots of cities across the country. I would say, frankly, the number one reason we're working there is for, in some way, those communities want to be competitive for a skilled and educated workforce because of the jobs and investment that will follow. Is this making sense? Uh, you can interrupt me with a question. Okay, so, so now let's look at this workforce. Well, you probably already know this, but somebody recently observed, somebody who said, Cities are getting too much attention. Said, you know, the same number of millennials, you know, folks under 35, uh, are uh, living in suburbs today as, as 10 years ago. And with that, <clears throat> the same person, that the only difference is the ones that are smarter and have more education or more education and more money are moving into cities. And that's the whole point. The more the skilled and educated workforce we're talking about, at the time they're most likely to move, the people who, who really determine where jobs and investment go are choosing cities at a resounding pace. And uh, so if you have four years, anything less than four years of education, college education, you're probably moving out of an urban core, not, not so much Elkhart, but in, in larger cities. And it's more because housing is getting more expensive. Four years or more, you're moving in. So, Fast forward, the kind of, the, the most important thing a community like Elkhart can do to attract the workforce of tomorrow that really bring jobs and investment here and unlock jobs for everybody else is a place like the River District. It's an urban, mixed-use, walkable, lively place. So how is this translating into the marketplace, for example? Well, if you look at the rents for office, 
um, uh, across the country. This goes actually back to the 90s, but particularly since uh, 2000, they've been rising much faster, excuse me, much faster for urban office space than suburban, because in suburbs it's hard to attract the workforce. So it, it, urban is where these employers want to be. And frankly, if you look at housing markets, the same thing has happened uh, since 2000, particularly the price per square foot of urban housing, I think places like the River District that actually uh, you know, lost over stores downtown on Main Street have risen more than twice as fast as suburban values. And this, goes, this is a very established trend. I want to emphasize all the demographics that underlie this, uh, both the opportunity and the economic development paradigm shortage of workers, have about 20 more years in them at least. So this is very much the time to act. Uh, and you've got the leadership and the commitment to act, which I think we think is wonderful. So I'll conclude, conclude with a couple of things that talk about how do we translate these kinds of observations into the kind of place that can really help build the future of an Elkhart, of Elkhart that belongs to everybody. So it starts with walkability. You've heard a lot about walkability. Well, walkability is not just a nice sidewalk and trees. Walkability is also a critical mass of shops and restaurants and cool things to walk by. It requires enough development. It requires the density that unlocks amenity. It requires a critical mass of people and activity and a, and a real mix of things going on that makes these sidewalks fun and interesting to, to walk on and, for example, makes the River District a destination. But when we say destination, it has to be a destination in this day and age for everybody. And uh, uh, that means not only is it easy to get to, can you take a bike, can you walk, maybe you can get on a bus, can you drive there? But there are also things there like Lundquist Park, like the Aquatic Center, like a new town green that Jeff's going to talk about, that attract, not just attract, they actively invite everybody to part of the Elkhart community to make this, the River District, part of their lives too. Everybody is connected to it socially as well as by transportation. And then this brings us to diversity. And I'm sure everybody in this room will take out of faith, believes in diversity. But let me give you two very pragmatic reasons why this district has to be a place where diversity really works. One is because if you ask anybody who's got a great successful company going today what makes it go, it's it's all the ideas from anybody from different cultures, from different backgrounds coming together that really unlock the opportunities going forward. But also, all of the net growth in our workforce in the next 20 years are people that today we probably refer to as minorities. And you need to be a place because remember, bright young skilled workers are what attracts the jobs and that's what we need, where these people feel really invited. And this district needs to be a place that actively invites everybody who wants to say, I want to live, work, and play here. Clearly, we want to be green. We'll talk as much about this. Uh, you heard David talk about access to the river. That's part of being able to really celebrate your natural setting. But it's also, frankly, there's a really strong business case for green planning and green development and green utilities. But I want to finish on authentic, because Elkhart is a really pretty cool, unique, and special place. It has a wonderful industrial, living industrial tradition not as common today. It's got a lot of folks here who really love to invent things with their, their minds and their hands. Uh, uh, you have actually a pretty interesting art scene. It's a, all of these qualities need to be represented in this district. And that doesn't mean buildings that look like the buildings on Main Street. It means the best and brightest of you, no matter what age you are, would see this as a place where you want to come work and you want to come uh, help build Elkhart's future, so that this really draws on the best and the brightest of your culture, your very unique and wonderful culture as a community. So on that note, it has been a pleasure and honor to work with all of you, and look forward to your comments and questions. Thanks. walkable community uh, for residential primary as, a, as our focus. 
So Lori has been instrumental in this. Uh, she is the principal in charge of Zimmerman Volk Associates market studies and is the firm's primary analyst of demographic, market, and lifestyle trends. Her development um, of their target market me methodology and analytical tools are used to determine the market potential for downtown housing, and that includes mixed income, mixed tenure, repopulation, and stabilization of fragile inner city neighborhoods, and for new mixed use, pedestrian oriented traditional neighborhoods. Her work has been instrumental in bringing Zimmerman Volk Associates to national prominence. Uh, Volk has conducted more than 65 uh, downtown studies across the country in cities ranging in size from Petersburg. Uh, Virginia that has a population of about 32,000 and Detroit, Michigan 713,000. She's also done some local area work in South Bend as well as Grand Rapids I believe and so welcome Lori.
30 households that represent the absolute perfect market types to live in a downtown and a walkable neighborhood. So who are they? It's very important to understand who they are, particularly by life stage, because depending upon what life stage you're in, will have a huge impact on the kind of housing that you're looking for. And it turned out 70% of the market potential for housing in downtown and the River District is a group of young people, basically the millennials aged about 20 to 40. Now this is actually great news because young people are the future of the city, and if you can establish a large number of young people living downtown, that's all the better for the ultimate health of the city. There are a couple of different market groups that are the largest that we looked at, ranging from small single cities that are mostly single person households to fast track professionals, mostly mid to upper level professionals that are half of them are single and half of them are couples. Empty nesters and retirees are the second largest group, and those are essentially baby boomers. Uh, that represents about 21% of the annual market. It's a little smaller than it has been, say, if I had done this study 10 years ago, and that's partly because of the impact of the housing crash and recession, which has made it a lot more difficult for older couples to sell their single family houses because that entry level market, the millennials, tend to be renters and not buyers. So the issue of who you're going to sell your house to has become a major one. So as a result, empty nesters are a smaller portion of the market than they used to be. And there are several very vital older couple groups here, Main, what we call a mainstream empty nesters and middle American retirees. Middle American because that's where we are here in the middle of America. Family households represent the smallest segment of the annual potential market, just 9%. And they're primarily a market for townhouses. And that's because most family households in the United States don't choose to live in multifamily housing. It's only in the big cities like New York, Chicago, San Francisco, you get a considerable percentage of family households living in rental apartments <laughs> or condominiums. So that, that's a very small segment of the market here, but it's going to grow over the next few years as those millennials who have insisted on remaining single are finally, the leading edge millennials, are finally starting to have children. And again, we have a various groups of families that represent the market from multi-ethnic families to what we call uptown families, family households that genuinely prefer to live in urban walkable neighborhoods. So when you look at that group of households, what kind of housing types would they really be looking for? And predominantly because there's so many young people that represent that part of the market, 71% of the housing that is built in the River District should be rental to attract those households. Condominiums for sale, lofts, and apartments represent about 11% of the market, and townhouses or row houses about 18% of the market. So, what kind of choices do people have today? And what we found was not much in terms of new construction. The most recent property we could find that was built in the city or in the suburbs was built in 2001, which makes it 16 years, 17 years old. Um, Yorkwood Center is already existing on the um, River District property, but it is a much older community. So the basic rent range for apartments in the city is about $425 to $1,100 a month. Uh, in terms of pricing, again, there are very few condominiums or townhouses, no real townhouses that we could see on the market. And those that were, were very priced very low. So there was really no way any analyst could come in and try to determine the market potential based on what has already been built. Our, our optimum market position is based on the people who will be moving here and what their financial capabilities are. So annually, about 722 of those households are renters. And this chart shows how they break out in terms of what they can afford in rent per month based on spending only 25% of their income on rent. And you can see that it's skewed to the lower end, 29% can afford rents between 500 to 1,000, and that's because of the predominance of the young people. And to the upper end, 25% of the market can afford rents.
that's higher than 1750 a month. And that's because of the families and empty nesters that are at the upper end of the income scale. So when we looked at what the market position should be for new development in the River District, we determined that the rent range should go from $635 to $1,775 a month for studio apartments starting at 400 square feet to two and three bedroom apartments at 1,250 square feet. Now that is reflective of what the market is looking for. We did the same analysis as far as the condo buyers, 115 a year. And again, it's not quite so skewed. The bulk of the market is for the less expensive condominium units between 100 and 250,000, but there are a few at the over 350. So we decided to break the market into two different product types, lofts, uh, for sale lofts, which appeal to young people and they're the bulk of the market with base prices from $135,000 to $190,000 for units containing between 750 and 1,100 square feet, appealing and able to attract a, a, a sizable portion of young people. And then for the empty nester retiree market, what we call mansion condominium buildings, buildings <coughs> about four to six units, with units containing between 1,150 and 1,550 square feet and priced from 235 to over 300,000. Now these are more highly amenitized than the lofts and uh, are smaller so that if there's not the requirement of trying to get 50 people to make down payments to make the project work. Again, the same analysis for row houses and townhouses. Uh, and again, we see the same skew between the lower, less expensive units and the more expensive units. And we again decided to divide the market into two uh, less expensive row houses <laughs> that appeal to younger people who may not have any children at all, priced from 160 to 210 for 950 to 1300 square <laughs> units. And townhouses, again, to uh, appeal to the families and the more affluent empty nester market with base prices from 215 to 335,000 for 1,200 to 2,000 square foot units. So now that we know what kind of units we should build and how much they should be priced at, what, how fast will those units be absorbed? How fast will the market actually rent or buy those units? Well, based on our experience in, uh, we've now actually done more than 85 downtown studies, we come to understand that the market capture is really based on the relative size of the city. And Elkhart, uh, we believe, can easily capture between 15 to 20 percent of the annual rental market and between 8 and a half and 10 percent of the annual for sale market, which means that you could be uh, accommodating 136 to 176 new rental and for sale housing units per year over the next five years which means that the downtown study area, including the core downtown and the river district, would contain between 680 to 880 new housing units, both rental and for sale, which would provide greater housing diversity in the city, a lot more young people to walk along the streets of the downtown, and greater in income diversity. So we look very much forward to seeing what happens here over the next three years because I have a feeling Elkhart may be one of those cities that exceeds our projections. So thank you very much.
the principal firm that was behind the new urbanism movement. Since 2007, he has led Speck & Associates, a boutique planning firm that specializes in making American downtowns thrive. Jeff is also the co-author of the Smart Growth Manual and the modern classic Suburban Nation, Nation which uh, Wall Street Journal calls the urbanist Bible. His latest book, Walkable City, is what Christian Science Monitor calls a timely, important, and a delightful, insightful work. It, it's been the best-selling city planning book from 2013 to 2016. Jeff. Hi, everybody. I have the fun part. I get to show you the pretty pictures, so you, <clears throat> it was worth the wait. Um, so we got the call, I got the call about <clears throat> maybe 14 months ago, it seems like yesterday, um, from Shelly and David Weaver, and, um, and it was a very strange call because I'm used to getting calls from either cities, typically mayors, um, or from developers you know, who have large parcels they want to develop. And my firm is small, I only take on a couple jobs a year. At this point in my career, I'm not interested in taking on jobs that aren't gonna get built. And so actually, what I've learned through this period of working is that you don't get stuff built unless the whole community is behind it. And typically when a mayor or a city calls me up and says, we want you to come work in our community, I say, okay, have you involved uh, the business community? And when you both put money in the deal, then I'll come and, and work there. And typically when a developer comes up, I say, what's your relationship with the city? Because frankly, they're going to have to build half the stuff that we, that we draw. And if, if they actually don't have skin in the game, then this isn't moving forward. And I was a little bit confused when these guys first called. Because I said, are you, a, are you from the city? And they said, no. And I said, oh, so you're developers then. And they said, well, not really. I said, well, who are you? And it, <clears throat> it turns out that, that they'd done the heavy lifting before, before they even called up, which is that they put together this group that represented the, as best as they could, all the different sectors in your in your city, and and that's why I'm just astounded. You know, we had a meeting today; a bunch of investors were there. Uh, we've got a first phase, as you were shown, that's imagined uh, being done within just a few years. And there's there, there seems to be an incredible amount of momentum uh, behind this happening. And frankly, it was already happening in the sense of the stuff that was already being built. Um, the, the aquatic center, the anticipated new, sh new um, shopping center, the new housing development, very large, that's going on site. Um, and all that was missing was a plan to tie it all together. <clears throat> now, what happens in typical American development these days, particularly in the suburbs, is the pieces just land. And because no one ever thought about how they connect, the only way to get between them is driving, and then you have a drivable uh, society and not a walkable society. And these folks realized that, and they said, you know, if, if, if the whole is going to be greater than the sum of the parts, we need a plan that ties it all together. And that's why we were brought in. And um, I've got a great team that you've met, you've met some of them. Uh, and together we've uh, created what I'm going to show you tonight. This is not the final presentation. I'm looking, I'm looking at all of you in the eye. I want to see you back here in April um, when we have more to show you. And um, yeah, there's stuff that we're not giving away tonight just so you'll come back uh, in April. Um, but we're going to show you most of it because we want your feedback. And the principal reason we're here talking to you tonight is so that afterwards you come up and you speak to us privately. We're not going to do Q&A. We want to be more efficient. So afterwards, come up, speak to us privately, one-on-one. -on -one, we'll all be around the room. Put your comments on the images um, and give us as much feedback as you can. Because we've had a lot of smaller groups, but this is the first time I've addressed a very large uh, group on this, um, on this development. So um, my specialty is walkability. I focused my practice on it. Uh, I counted, we heard the word walkable 14 times before I got up here on stage. So we know that it's what we want. Uh, and uh, you know, millennials, millennials are demanding it, a lot of empty nesters. Uh, it, it, among both those groups, which we've heard are demographically dominant, it's always something that is listed by a large number of people in polls as a prerequisite for where they're going to choose to live. So I focused my, my, my practice on it, not for that reason, but because for me, if a place isn't walkable, it isn't a great place. And I'm a city planner and I want to make great places, so I've reoriented my practice around walkability. I have this thing I call the general theory of walkability. It's a bit of a theory, <clears throat> but it says, if we're going to get people to walk in a community, in America, you know, in which driving is so easy, and in which most people own a car, and it's there in the driveway between you and everything, and the easiest thing is to just fall into it and drive everywhere. If you're going to get people to walk in that circumstance, the walk has to be as good as the drive. 
And for the walk to be as good as the drive, it has to do four things. And it has to do those four things simultaneously. The walk has to be useful, it has to be safe, it has to be comfortable, and it has to be interesting. And uh, the first part of my talk today, which I'm going to hopefully get done in about seven minutes, is how you do each of those things. And then we'll get into the plan. The, re the reason to walk has to do with uh, how we plan in a suburban environment versus how we plan in an urban environment. And it's a question of mixing uses. How large an area of land is each use given? Are they integrated with each other? Do you have the, you know, the large blob plan, which was the model for 50 or 60 years, which basically rules out the possibility of walkability? Or are you more like a place like Manhattan, where all the uses are piled on top of each other, and they're confetti-like, and they're small, and they're integrated? That's the model that now planning has turned back to, and it's the first step of making a more walkable place. But when you have an existing place, particularly like your downtown, that's where the greatest potential for having more walkability in your community is, because you've already got the commercial uses. It's almost impossible to bring commercial uses into a residential neighborhood. Just try to put a 7-Eleven in a cul-de-sac these days and see how long you last, right? So bringing more housing into a downtown is usually the way to go. And when you look at our downtown, when you look at all the uses that are in our downtowns, and you ask, you know, what is missing or underrepresented in that downtown area? Because the more uh, of, a, of a comprehensive and somewhat balanced mix of uses we have, then the more walkable it will be. It's almost always housing that is underrepresented. And what you find when you bring housing back in con considerable numbers into a downtown area is that everything else gets better. Even the schools eventually get better in downtown areas because people move in and they demand better schools. But probably what's more relevant in the short term is that, is that things like stores and restaurants get better. Because for example, a great gym or a great restaurant, it can't survive on just lunchtime trade or just nighttime trade. It really needs both, right? The best restaurants need to be open for lunch and dinner. And so when you have both workers and residents, then you, that stuff starts to flourish and everything gets better and better. It's the experience we've had bringing more walkability to places where I work, like uh, downtown Oklahoma City, for example. Um, that's the first category. By the way, this is a two hour lecture, but you're getting it in seven minutes, so I'm going to that. Um, the second category, the safe walk, is the stuff the city can fix pretty quickly. It's already working on that even before we arrive. It typically has to do with the speed of vehicles. And you are eight times likely to die being hit by a car going 35 as you are by a car going 25. And so everything we can do to just stop the speeding and get the drivers to go the marked speed is, is the first effort that we make to make places safer. And it has to do with all the different aspects of the environment that make drivers either comfortable speeding or not comfortable speeding. Um, I'm only going to cover a few of them uh, today because I don't have time for more. Uh, the first is obviously the number of lanes. And of course, no one's going to walk on this highway, but then you have cities like Oklahoma City, where I mentioned I worked, where they just had many more lanes than they needed. And of course, the wider the street, the more lanes, the longer it takes to cross, the faster the cars go. <clears throat> so wherever you can eliminate unnecessary lanes, you are making a big difference. Now it's hard to do because most of our streets, at least during rush hour or here as we call it rush minute, are rather congested. Just kidding. Um, and and uh, you don't want to do anything that's going to increase congestion because let's face it, most of us are still driving and we don't want to unduly inconvenience the drivers. Um, but there's one wonderful trick that happens to apply in Elk Park. And it's, it's actually got a name when planners call it the classic American road diet. And the classic American road diet is when you turn a four lane into actually a three laner with a shared center turn lane. Now four lane roads are interesting because they're, they're super dangerous because the left hand turn lane is also the fast lane, right? But they're super inefficient because the fast lane is also the left hand turn lane. And if you think about your experience on these streets, there's a lot of jockeying, there's a lot of jamming on the brakes, there's a lot of accidents. And what's not surprising to people is when you do a road diet from four lanes to three lanes, not only do you get room for, for parking or something else that you can put in, this, in the roadway, but actually the number of injuries drops very precipitously. And whenever they've done this, it's been measured and you save lives. But what no one expected, and I don't expect you to be able to see the fine print here, <clears throat> this, is uh, this is 23 different North American four to three road diets that were conducted over the last decade. And if you add up the daily trips before and the daily trips after, the roads lost no capacity just as many cars after as before because of the efficiency of having that center turn lane that's just for turns. 
So that's why these are proliferating across the country and, and actually the world, because you, you get extra roadway for something else, you save lives, and you don't increase congestion. And we have that opportunity with an effort that had already begun before our arrival on, um, on Elkhart, uh, sorry, on um, Jackson Boulevard. Parallel parking, often forgotten, it's an essential barrier of steel that protects the curb from moving vehicles. Uh, this is happy hour in Fort Lauderdale, famous for its happy hour. You notice you can park on one side of the street and not the other. And on the park side of the street, this is happy hour. And here's happy hour on the unparked side of the street. Because people do not feel comfortable without that barrier of steel there. So that's very important. Street trees are another part of the equation. Um, they make sidewalks more pleasant, more comfortable, but they also slow cars down. Cars slow down when there are street trees there, uh, sometimes dramatically, <laughs> all at once, but better hitting a tree than a pedestrian. Uh, and this is what a street feels like if you don't have the park cars and if you don't have the street trees. And then uh, the third category is kind of the trickiest one. It's a little bit counterintuitive. The comfortable walk. We talk about this as planners. Um, a plaza is only as good as its edges. A street is only as good as its street walls. Humans like to feel contained. And it's like all animals, the, the evolutionary biologists tell us, all animals are simultaneously seeking prospect and refuge. You want to see your predators who might attack you, and you want to feel that your flanks are covered from attack. And that feeling of your flanks being covered is what you get when streets have edges. So you know, what's the right ratio? You know, is it is it six to one? Is it three? Is it one to three? Is it one to one? They say one to one is the Renaissance ideal. Beyond one to six, six times as wide as it is high. Beyond one to six, you don't feel contained anymore. Uh, six to one, height to width can be great. Even in a northern climate, this is Salzburg, which is darker than Elkhart. Um, the opposite of Salzburg is Houston. Of course, this is an old, drawn, an old image of Houston, but it sends the important message, which is that in most places, it's the surface parking lot that's the principal villain that's causing you not to have that sense of containment on a street edge. So hiding parking lots is super important. And finally, the interesting walk, we talked about the one-to-one -one ratio there, the Renaissance ideal. This is one-to-one. -one. This is in Grand Rapids, where I've done a fair amount of work. Um, it's one-to-one, -one, but no one wants to walk on this street, because when one side of the street is an exposed parking deck, and the other side is a conference facility that was apparently designed in admiration for that parking deck, you know, it's just boring. <laughs> No one wants to be bored. And so the other thing is to you know, hide your parking, whether it's surface parking or structured parking, hide your parking decks. It only takes 20 feet of building to hide 200 feet of parking. And so um, that, you know, and, and have friendly, nice faces on your building that, that are, that are in, that, you know, that we, we call them thick edges. You know, not just mirror glass walls, but nice, thick, active edges that give life to the sidewalk. So that's, that's the theory, and then that leads into the plan, um, but I wanted to point out that when we arrived, there were a few plans that awaited us that were, were, you know, that were on their way to to delivering a result in the River District. And you can see here, this is the aquatic center that was coming, and there was a plan for a parking deck. And look at the wisdom, right? People already knew that we're going to align that parking deck um, with structure. But there was a larger issue, which is you're entering the River District here. And I noticed this as soon as I arrived and saw these images. You're entering the River District and actually you have to walk past this very long parking lot before you're really getting contained by buildings in the way that we talked about, right? So we saw that as, a, as an opportunity. Um, and then similarly, the plan that was underway for the new supermarket in this location, um, it, it wisely also had a little bit of a green in front. So you can imagine, you know, one parent hanging out with the kids. Well, although we hear there's no more two-parent families, but we'll just ignore that for now. Um, one parent hanging out with the kid in a green while others are shopping. But there's a plan for a, a, a river landing down here for putting sh boats into the water. And uh, we want people to walk down the street. And you can see on both sides, uh, in, in much of, for much of the way, the street isn't lined by buildings. So again, it seemed an opportunity to do something uh, even better there. So let's get into our plan. And um, I'm going to take you through first the neighborhood structure, which uh, is kind of a lucky thing we inherited which is, you know, traditionally throughout planning literature history, but also through the history of human settlement, neighborhoods have almost always been a five minute walk from edge to center, so about a half mile across. That happens to be the landmass that we're dealing with here is a perfect kind of five minute walk neighborhood, 
And its two main streets, Jackson and Elkhart, are meeting right in the center. So we already inherited this great uh, framework to work with. And then we said, okay, how can we enhance that framework with civic places that are special um, and that will draw people towards them? So you have the park, Bunquist Park, you have Waterfront Park, you have the, the Waterfront um, uh, 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 Riverwalk, which is going to be completed and what a wonderful you know, mile and a half circuit. You can run it twice and measure three miles and, and you've had a great lunch. Um, but there's a center, and so at the center we want to have some public space. But then there's also the need, both, both the, the value of the supermarket here, but the need to draw people east. And so we actually took the green that was suggested earlier in that plan of the supermarket and turned it into a real village square. The kind of square you would be more likely to find in the center, but which we couldn't fit in the center. But by pulling it laterally, we actually bring energy deeper into the neighborhood uh, from downtown, which of course the connection to is so important. So zooming in uh, to the plan, what you essentially see first is the improvements that are being made to the Elkhart Avenue, uh, sorry, to the Jackson Boulevard streetscape. So this whole streetscape is being remade uh, starting like today, it's going out to bid. Um, we've been working with the city very closely on the design of it, and as I mentioned, they were already going to a three-lane um, solution. But we have a little bit of a bonus, which is there aren't that many left-hand turn lanes um, off of the street. So, in fact, we don't have, a, we're going from a four lane to a three lane, but where you don't have a left hand turn lane, you can put in a grassy tree median. Because there's no reason to be in that lane, uh, in that location. So the proposal is to go to three lanes, which allows us to widen the sidewalks, to have a median where there are no turns. Um, and you see in this image, but this is what it looks like. And we're looking now west, back towards um, downtown Elkhart. This is Elkhart Drive coming in. This is, we're on Jackson. And what you see are the wider sidewalks, places to sit. And then here, you have the center. It's a green and a plaza. And I can show you on the plan that <coughs> this building makes a square corner so that this odd intersection produces a nice little attached green. And then what we've done is we've pulled this building back to designate the center. And that's a plaza in front of the site, which is designated for the hotel, which is planned for this location. So you put the hotel right in the center of town, right, like the Hotel de Ville in some European city. And there it is, place to sit and hang out in front, and the little green across the street. The median with trees that drops off for the left-hand turn lane to go down Elkhart. So that's that location. Now, we want to complement the retail of downtown. We don't want to cannibalize downtown. We don't want to steal merchants into this district. But we need to have a certain amount of retail in order to, for it to be a mixed-use, live, and successful place. So what we've done is we've created a minimum retail zone and then a maximum retail zone that you can't go beyond where it's optional. So the, mi the minimum is surrounding the center, is the solid line, and then reaching to the square that's in front of the supermarket and surrounding that square. And that's the heart of the district and it's the heart of the retail. If people want to put more shops reaching all the way back to Main Street to have retail continuity, that makes sense. And I would prioritize these over all the others. Um, but there's also opportunities at the extension of Park Street, down Elkhart Avenue where it's already planned for right here, um, and uh, a little bit north on, on North Elkhart Avenue. But most of the retail will be concentrated in that location. Of course, retail is much better when it's adjacent and concentrated. Um, Next, moving to the challenge that we described, that I described earlier, which you'll remember the earlier plan where the aquatic center was, was parking lot was exposed to view during this walk. So one of the first things we've done, and I'll be zooming in, is to line this street with buildings. But we actually went a step further and created a, 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 a kind of a mini main street that actually takes you to one of the front doors of this aquatic center. So not only are you having a good experience as a pedestrian walking through, you know, walking, you come from downtown, you cross the bridge, you enter a gateway of buildings, and then you have buildings on both sides of you, but then you have a nice Main Street experience also headed to this doorway. And that looks like this. And we took a little liberty, placed these buildings on either side of that street, and took an existing 
raised portion of the building and put a tower on top. We ignored the fact that these, the steel has already arrived for this building. The steel is being delivered to build this tower. And so we had a, 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 one of many uh, conversations, but a very important uh, conversation with the architect today, where we talked about what it might be possible to do to put on top of this building. It is possible to put something there. It's going to take a little extra money. Um, it doesn't need to be uh, you know, a cupola with, with windows in it. It could just be a, a, a structure with columns and a trellis or something. But if it's lit nicely at night, it's the sort of thing, we call this a terminated vista. When you aim a street at a building, then the building responds. That's how you create a sense of place in communities. So we're hopeful, and the meetings are going to start tomorrow about how maybe something like this can go on the building. But what really matters is that you can approach from Jackson Boulevard, you can approach the building down a street that has buildings on both sides of it. And we even gave you a speedo shot because of the, of the swimming uh, facility, which I think would do well in it, right? Um, but now zooming in, remember, here's the plan we showed you before, and it was the exposed parking lot. And where we are now, because we've had the opportunity to bring in additional development, oops, sorry, where we are now is... Um, let me go back. I think either I dropped the slide or I went past it. Yeah, I went past it. So, I mean, I dropped it. So, here's what it was before. And you'll recall now we have a building that basically does this. And then it closes all of this space. Now, we went right along. Parking was a real issue. And the biggest conversation during this whole planning effort was, do we really need the parking structure? Many of you may already be aware the city had essentially committed $10 million to putting a parking deck that we saw right here next to the entry to the aquatic center. And actually, um, I began this effort thinking, OK, we'll just keep that parking deck. But we did a lot of work, a lot of studying. And we, we asked, you know, what would that $10 million be used for instead? And if you go through the district now, you know it's like nothing but parking, right? I mean, there's a service parking lot, empty next to service parking lot. So it was our challenge and struggle. We, we were given the criteria from the different users, especially the aquatic center, uh, that we had to meet. And we have met their criteria without having a structured parking lot, which means we have $10 million to spend on the parks and the greens and the plazas <laughs> instead within this development, which we think is a much better use of your money, especially uh, uh, of a concern is what happens in the big events uh, in the center. And when there's a big event, we take advantage as most of these, you know, there aren't there aren't many other aquatic centers in America like this. This is truly a, a special, you know, top-notch kind of aquatic center, but we talked to the other ones and we found out how they handle their peak event parking, and they do it a lot of it with satellite parking within a five-minute walk. So the strategy was to identify all the parking lots within five minutes that would serve the center, and that was the ultimate thing we needed to give us comfort that we could use that parking garage money uh, for other things. Now, moving down the street to the supermarket, we zoom in and we see here what happens is Junior Achievement Drive, which was going just like this, remember there was a little green plan right there, we've made it perpendicular to Jackson, which is enlarged and made it, and this drawing isn't even, it's deceiving, it's a very large, uh, uh, public public square that's in front of the supermarket and programmed uh, and if, so now comparing here's the scheme before remember when this was all just open street uh, and now we're at this where the street is enclosed by buildings and, and similarly um, you know these this was just really a placeholder but these were apartments that were sitting here and they were doing a couple things but one thing they were doing was privatizing the water's edge so you, yes you still have the river walk but, it, but only the people walking on the river walk get to enjoy that, that experience. And the, the, frankly, the real estate value of the river is not being brought any deeper into the project because it's blocked by these buildings. And then secondarily, they kind of have a parking lot address, right? They're not really sitting on a street, which is, someone comes to visit you, you don't want to say, I'm in building C. You want to say, I'm at 1420, you know, JA Drive. So um, um, this scheme, Instead, it takes all the housing and uses it not only to line Junior Achievement Drive, but to also line this square. And now between the supermarket, the eventual buildings across the street, the uh, Mexican market, existing building, one more building needed there, you've really shaped this whole experience coming down to the landing 
at the water's edge. And then in addition, we've created a riverfront or riverside drive that connects to, pra to Prairie Street here. And that takes this amenity of the river's edge and it brings it deep within the community because anyone driving through uh, gets to experience that. And it's a great site for townhouses. Here's the image of the square that some of you have seen already. We're looking south. We're looking down Jake Junior Achievement Drive. This is the new building to the south of the green. There's the supermarket. You program it with fountains, with places for older people, younger people, maybe a dog park as well. I could go in here. There's room for all of those things. And that view is looking like this. And at the end of the view, you can barely see it. Um, there's a building down there at the end of the street, terminating your vista as you look down the street. And it's this, which is a storage facility for kayaks. And you know, we saved $10 million in the parking lot. So this is a, this maybe has bathroom, public bathrooms in it, and you can store canoes and kayaks in it. And then this, um, designed by JPR, is our water uh, front uh, boat, boat launch. Uh, and this is the Riverside Drive with the townhouses I've described on it. And these are the apartments heading up towards the supermarket. I realize I'm taking way too long, so I'm going to speed up. Um, finally, as you head east, there's this interesting condition. It's really a, a you wouldn't know it if you go there and happens. There's these big empty buildings sitting on it, but it's city owned, we control it. And it's 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 the perfect part of this isthmus that literally is is a you know, potential portage between this river and this river. Uh, and although the, the, the um, Corps of Engineers would never allow us to make a, a, an actual portage there, um, we can make it look like that. It's a space for, 20, for the 22 best new townhouses in Elkhart because you make a park out of it. And when you make a beautiful public place and line it by buildings, giving it you know, both prospect and refuge, you've got this perfect condition for selling real estate for a, a good profit. There's two beautiful trees here that we're preserving, setting the building back, um, and then uh, putting 22 housing lots in that location. There's no hurry to do this bit because it's kind of aside from the main part of the community, but it's a great opportunity and, and it seems to be the best solution for that problem. Um, we talked a bit about phasing. It's just flabbergasting that within three years, I mean, there's construction already happening here, and here, right? Within three years, all this orange stuff will be built or under construction. And within five years, the orange and the yellow. And this is only waiting because of property acquisition challenges, right? They don't want us to give us those properties. Today, we can change the map. But right now, that's holding us up. Um, but this is still a tremendous amount of development in a very short time. And then I wanted to zoom into phase one, because here's the part that's happening very quickly. And you can see in this one spot, you have the street that goes to the front of the aquatic center, the new buildings that are lining Jackson Boulevard, row houses facing outward to the improved Lundquist Park. And the whole thing adds up to about 177 housing units, also about 73,000 square feet of retail and 100,000 square feet of office, all in this one very first phase. And you can see it brings you essentially from downtown to the center of our community where Elkhart, the center of our project where Elkhart meets Jackson Boulevard. And then this is just looking at the entire map and adding up all the housing in it because you know this conversation has started with housing, it's gonna end with housing. Housing is what this district needs. And Lori talked about 600 to 800 housing units. We're also getting more right downtown on the Civic Plaza site. But this all adds up pretty much to the, um, to the number that we're, that we're aiming at. And so we can fit all in the district. And I would say that the, the real challenge, uh, if you talk to Lori behind the scenes, she'll tell you the real challenge here is not gonna be absorption, it's gonna be just building it fast enough. Do you have the capacity? Can we get some of those folks off of the line building RVs and get them building houses? Because um, you know, there's only so much capacity to produce. And so the real challenge here you know, isn't financial, it, it isn't, physical site, um, it isn't a planning challenge, it's really just, can we, you know, they will, they will sell it as fast as we can build, so let's build these houses, and now, um, thanks to all the work that was done prior, and this plan, we have a framework in which that can get done. So I think that's, uh, that's the end of my presentation, and is, is David, uh, Michelle, you're going to address these slides? Uh, okay.
So that's the plan. I hope you like it. And again, um, it's still in development. We, we want your input. Uh, I and the rest of the team will be over there uh, and looking forward to hearing from you. Thank you for listening. Uh, in his own experience uh, as one of the principals of 
Heritage Financial Group and their own uh, urban presence, downtown presence, uh, has played a very similar role. But I, before I close, and I'm, I'm just about done, um, this is the team that has worked on this project to this point. And I just mentioned, but I, I want to make a, take a minute to thank those individuals who may not be part of this effort directly, but who have set the stage and provided a role modeling and an example that this community can execute on these kinds of efforts. So I do want to thank and acknowledge Rex and Alice Martin for their vision as it related to the Nipco Water and Ice Park and their, their personal philanthropic investment. I want to thank Deborah Shaw and Craig Fulmer for their vision around the Riverwalk that has set some of the stage and the architecture and the, and the boundaries for this, as well as Tom Borger and Merle Nofsinger and Terry Hoganboom that, that took pioneering steps in building some of the newest professional office space in that same area, as well as Jack Sidney and others. Uh, I mentioned those names at the risk of leaving out someone who, who I may not be aware has been equally involved. And I apologize for that, but I didn't want to avoid doing that because these folks needed to be recognized for the work that they did 10, 15, 20, 25 years ago that gave us the confidence and set the stage for us to do this. And then I want to thank those that have been key contributors to this Aquatic Center project that led us. And I'm not going to go down a long, long list, but, but when Pete Legal and Thor and Jack Smith and Burati Crable and Patrick Industries and Lippert Components and Dometic Industries, when they all said, we may compete in, 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 the, in the crossroads and playing field of the RV industry and business in general, this is in the interest of our own community. And all of them have made lead gifts to make this aquatic center possible alongside of us and Beacon Hospital healthcare system and the Elkhart Community Schools in the city of Elkhart. Well, I'm now done recognizing folks, but all those individuals played key roles in this and deserve to be thanked and recognized. So as a whole, I would invite you to share your appreciation again. Uh, and then I have a couple of nice questions. Now, forgive me for looking at my phone. I'm not actually a 17-year-old that, that would do that to you, but. These were Shelley's notes to me while I was sitting here, the things, other things that I need, need to make sure that I mention. Uh, how believable is this plan? It is very believable. Uh, two years ago, I wasn't quite sure that where we would get and how we would pull this off, but those zones, those orange zones that were on that one map that said these will happen in the next one to three years, we, have, we own all and control all of that property. So David and Andy Myers, Myers Real Estate, have, have, have gone door to door and, and given tremendous effort, but they have acquired 30 properties in this river district that are represented by those orange zones. And so we can, with great confidence, know that we own the land that we're planning to build on and get after it. Uh, I want to remind you that you are asked, we're, we're just about done here, there are post-it note pads on the respective tables, so I believe there are some pens there as well. So if you have thoughts, Make a point, even if they're unrelated to that particular slide or presentation deck, make a note and, and stick it on there. And if, you, if you'd like to have some follow-up, put your name and phone number or something like that, and, and one of us on the team uh, will make a point to, to hear you out more fully. Um, ask team members questions. OK, so we're not going to do open Q&A, but those of us that have been present here and that, whose names are listed here are here. So if you have something you want to share, a thought, a suggestion, uh, follow up with one of us. Uh, please leave your comment cards, if you fill those out, on the front table as you leave. And visit the website, which is River District, Elkhart River District. <laughs> See? People it's a lot smarter than me to think this stuff through. Okay, we're district.com. So that concludes our, concludes our evening. Thank you all for your interest and your. Thank you.